Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, we are going to continue with our study of the book of John, and we're going to pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we are on chapter 1, verse 35. But bef uh, before we get started, let me ask uh, Brother Eric to say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. It's me again, the whole mole. Okay, back to you. All right, please subscribe to Brother Eric's channel. And uh, if you have not watched the previous episodes uh, of this study, uh, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Um, I'm happy if you're watching it live right now, but uh, it would be very helpful to you if you do watch it from the beginning, particularly the first few verses. Uh, of the Gospel of John are especially important and powerful. So I hope you will go back and watch that. But right now we're going to uh, pick up in verse 35 of chapter 1. I'm going to read it in the KJV, and then I'll probably end up looking at it in the Amplified later because uh, it amplifies it, and it may be helpful to us. Okay, so verse 35 says, Um Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Uh, well, I, uh, I mentioned earlier that... Uh, uh, I think, I, I don't know if it was on the study of John or if we were studying uh, early church history or Proverbs or, uh, or maybe it was Job. I don't know. But I, I remember talking about this recently that I, I've always been a little bit puzzled why Peter uh, is always given so much credit uh, for the time when he identified Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. You can find that in, I think it's in Matthew or Mark, but it's also in Luke uh, chapter 9, verse uh, 20, 21. Jesus asked his disciples, uh, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, um, and uh Jesus says, well, you didn't get this from man. You got it from my Father in heaven as he revealed it to you. And he says, from this point on, you're going to be known as Simon. You'll be known as Peter, the rock. And the Roman Catholics, of course, take a hold of that whole uh, section of verses there to identify him as the first pope. And the, and the, that's um, that uh, he is, Peter is the rock. But the truth is, that the rock that Jesus um, is talking about is the statement by Peter, the statement that he is the Christ. That's the rock, that's the foundation of our Christianity. It's not the person that she, uh, of Peter that's the rock. Um, but I've always been, not always, but for probably the last few years, I've been a little bit puzzled why Peter gets so much credit for identifying him because other people identify him as the Christ, the Son of God, uh, uh, before that point. And we already have here in, uh, in the first chapter of John, now let's back up just a little bit. I remember that uh, John calls him, uh, where was it? Uh, let me see. John calls him the Christ. Let me see. He identifies him in what verse? Uh, well, um, in verse 29, he identifies him as the Lamb of God. We talked about that, but I think he also identifies him at that point as the Son of God. Yeah, yeah. In verse 34, and this is John speaking. It says, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So as far as I can see, the very first time Jesus is uh, described as, as uh, his, uh, attributed 
with being the son of God, it's here by John the Baptist. I know that several other, couple of the other apostles identify him as the son of God. And these things happen long before Peter does it. I don't know if you have any theories on that, or if you've ever paid any attention to that, brother, but uh, what, what is your uh, response to that? Uh, it totally escaped me, Brother Luke. I've never had uh, thought about that. I had thought a lot about uh, how the Catholics take uh, the one verse that we previously mentioned about uh, Peter being called the rock, I believe that translates to little rock. Uh, what did you think about that? Yeah, uh, there's uh, there's two different forms of the word Petra. And I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but the term is used twice. And of course, uh, um, you have little rock and you have big, big rock in Greek. And it, it, it's talking about the, the Peter, he, he was called Peter instead of Simon and Peter or Cephas uh, in, in uh, I think in Greek it's Cephas but he um, he was um, called that because he was called that means rock but little rock the big rock or the foundation of Christianity is this statement by Peter that this is the Christ the son of the living God that's the foundation of Christianity the identity of who Jesus is and and uh, but the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, John the Baptist says it here in chapter one, right in the very beginning when Jesus first comes on the scene. Um, I think very soon we're going to see another one of the apostles refer to him in that way. And then there's another time coming up later where he's in a boat with the apostles and one of them calls him the son of God. Uh, I don't know if anybody watching uh, has any theories on this. Uh, maybe you can tell me, but uh, I've always been amazed about how this this uh time when when peter steps forward and, and you know first of all jesus sent the apostles around the countryside to preach and and, and uh, when they come back jesus says well what are the people saying about me who 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 are they saying i am and and he gets a variety of answers you know just like john the baptist was asked are you the prophet are you elias are you who are you well that people were saying all those things about Jesus. They have these different theories. So then Jesus asked the apostles, but okay, that's what the people are saying, but who do you say that I am? And Peter was the one that stepped forward to answer the question and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And it's this, it's a really big to-do made about this, this, this statement identifying Jesus. But what puzzles me is that he's, already identified that way uh, several times before that. Okay, maybe it's more significant to me than it is to other people, but if you have any theories on that, let me know. Let me go back to the text here. Um, 35 was, uh, okay, it says, again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, uh, and the two disciples heard him and they followed Jesus. Uh, have you ever noticed how uh, people uh, oftentimes, when they meet Jesus, uh, they just start following him? I <laughs> I, I muted myself right, right in the middle of my statement here. Uh, like, I think when Peter and Andrew first meet him or something, they just like drop their nets and they just start following him. They, they, they stop being fishermen and becoming uh, disciples. Uh, it's an, it's a, isn't it amazing to you how people, they, they meet him and decide they're going to follow him. They just drop everything else in their life and, and follow him. Oh, it's not amazing at all, Brother Luke. Uh, when Jesus speaks, uh, it don't matter who or what you are, it's going to listen. Well, we know that not everybody responds in that way. I mean, there, there's most of the people who heard Jesus and met Jesus, they didn't respond that way. They didn't follow him. He, only a, a small percentage of the people uh, ended up following him. Okay, uh, I retract that previous statement. <laughs> I, uh, I, I would like to think that if I met him 
2,000 years ago at that time, if I lived in and met him, that, that I would react the way that Peter and Andrew did and the way that these disciples did. They just, they had been following John the Baptist and he said, that's the Lamb of God. And they just went and followed, started following Jesus. Um, I think these might be come two of his apostles later. Let me, I don't know who they are, if it's, they're identified at this point. Okay, uh, and, the, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being uh, interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Um, well, it doesn't tell us where he abode. I don't imagine it was very impressive. Um, he talks about how, uh, the, you know, um, animals have places to live, but he didn't have a place to lay his head at some point in coming up. He talks like that, but I think he probably kind of spent the night sometimes in, in uh, people's houses. Uh, he, he seems to me he was kind of homeless. He didn't have a regular home. Was He had a regular address. Brother? Uh, he might have been staying with his mom. Yeah, a lot of people are doing that now. They, they get all grown up, finish college, and can't get a job, and they move back with mom and dad. But that's a little bit different, isn't it? Uh, it was, uh, in his case, uh, I'm assuming that his father had already died probably se se several years at least before Jesus began his ministry. So his mother was a widow. And so I'm sure that Jesus and his brother James and the rest of the, he had another brother named Jude and he had sisters. And uh, assuming they all, they all probably still lived there Unless James and Jude got married and moved out, I don't know. But uh, we know Jesus wasn't married, contrary to what the uh, something, what's that book, something code, uh, da, da, Vinci, da Vinci Code, that book. Uh, they're saying that he was with Mary Magdalene and they had children, which is, you know, it's insane, insane uh, blasphemy. But... Uh, being a single Jewish man, you know, I'm assuming he still did live with his mother. And, uh, and then now that he's starting his ministry, maybe he did go back and live in his mother's house part of the time. But I think as we go along, we'll see he didn't really have a regular residence. He was just staying wherever people would let him stay. And, and uh, sometimes probably in the outdoors he would stay. Okay. Okay. Uh... Uh, verse 40, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Okay, so uh, I was right about that. Andrew, um, we have two sets of brothers here with uh, that became apostles. You got Peter and Andrew, and we have James and John. And uh, John, of course, wrote, the Gospel of John that we're reading and studying now, he wrote several epistles and he wrote the book of Revelation, I believe. That's disputed who the author is, but I think it was John the Apostle who did that. Um, and, uh, and then his brother James, I don't know what happened to him uh, eventually. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced that that James is not the same James as we find in the book of James. I, I believe, as we discussed in our study on early church history, uh, I believe that that James is the brother of the Lord who was not one of the apostles, not one of the original 12 apostles. So, but we got John and James, and we got Peter and Andrew were brothers. So that's four of the 12 right there. But uh, Andrew, it says here that he was a follower of John the Baptist. So he was already involved in discipleship and some kind of ministry for service to God. And, and uh, so now 
he leaves John the Baptist. I don't know how long he was with him, but I'm, I'm guessing probably a long time, months, maybe, maybe a year or two. I don't know how long John the Baptist ministry lasted. I don't know if you have any idea about that, but he seemed to be committed as a disciple of John the Baptist. And then just suddenly, as soon as John identifies him as the Lamb of God, he leaves John, doesn't say goodbye, doesn't say boo here. I mean, maybe he did. There's a lot of things that have happened that are not written down. Maybe he had a long, big hug with, with John the Baptist. And, and uh, thanks for teaching me all this time. And I love being part of your ministry. But now that's the Lamb of God. I got to go be with him. I don't know how it all transpired. And in, in the scriptures, it just says he left and followed Jesus. Uh, but we're going to find out that this Andrew, uh, he, he'll be introducing uh, uh, his brother, Peter, to Jesus. Uh, brother, what's your response to all that? Uh, yes, Brother Luke, uh, absolutely right. Now, uh, Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist went on to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and he first got his brother Peter and introduced him to Christ now later on Jesus is walking by the boat and he gets is it Peter and Andrew that he tells them to follow me uh, yeah that's coming up I think it's the next couple of verses uh, so let's go into that. Uh, verse 41. Well, I'll, I'll go back to verse 40. One of the two which heard John speak, and when John spoke, he said, that's the Lamb of God. Uh, he says, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Okay, so here we have <laughs> another example of what I've been saying. We have John the Baptist call him the, the, the Lamb of God, the Son of God. Now we have Andrew refer to Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And we're going to find several other apostles and identify him as that. But when Peter identifies him as that, I don't, I, I don't, I've never understood. If anyone can help me, tell me why that is elevated to such a, a point where, uh, because he's already been identified that by numerous other people. No theories on that, huh? No, I, I didn't, wasn't aware that there was a to do about that. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know. You, uh, don't, don't you know that Peter seems to be given credit for for uh, you know that uh, that statement? He's the one that points him out. This is who he is, he, and it's it's a big deal. All right. Let me go to the next verse. Uh, verse forty-two. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Um, so now this is something that didn't stand out to me before either. So see, he's already, he first meets Peter, I mean, Simon. He first meets Simon, the brother of Andrew. When he first meets him, he says, you're Simon, son of Jonah. Simon bar Jonah, well, he's going to be called. That just means, bar means son of. Uh, so he's Simon, the son of Jonah. And uh, he says, but you're going to be known as Cephas, which means uh, a, a stone. And this is long before that time when Peter identifies him as the Christ and he gets called, uh, named Peter. He's already named Peter right here, or 
Cephas. Uh, Cephas, I think, is the, the Greek word used, and Peter, Petra, I don't know. I, I don't know. Do you know which is Cephas and, and Peter, uh, which is which? Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but it is interesting. I never uh, noticed that either. Uh, you say later on in the book of John, he'll be uh, naming him uh, Peter again? Well... I don't think in the, in the book of John, but uh, but we know it happened. It, I, it's in Luke. As I told you, it's Luke chapter 9, verse 20, 21. Uh, and then also, I believe it's the same story is told in uh, Mark or Matthew. Uh, I don't think it's in the gospel of John. But uh, this, this, when he first calls him, names him Peter right here, says you're going to be called uh, Cephas, which means a stone. This isn't like months or years down the road. This is his first time he ever meets him. He, he names him now. That's is that a surprise? Uh, are you sure it, the story takes place later on in the other gospels? Oh, oh yeah, most definitely. Most definitely, because uh, the story in the in the in, in Luke uh, and, and the other one it, account of it is they've they've already been following Jesus for a long, long time, and, and uh, they've been sent out on a mission to go to the, around the countryside and and preach, uh, and when they come back, he Jesus asked them, "Well, what are all the people saying about me? Who do they say I am?" And, and so. Uh, this is, yeah, definitely, it, chronologically, uh, it, that happens much, much later. I mean, if, if this was the time uh, that he just met Peter. I mean, he just met him right now for the first time. He, he, he could not say, I'm going to name you Peter now because you're the one that answered my question. He didn't, he's not even asking the question here to all the apostles. There are no apostles yet. He hasn't even chosen 12 well, now, my only explanation for that would be Jesus is just reiterating uh, it later on. I've had to reiterate uh, to my lawyers their offices uh, several times. Uh, sometimes they just need to be told more than once. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, there's there's no doubt that he's reiterating it. But what stands out to me, see, as we're going through this now, we're studying it carefully. And if you just read it, and you read all the gospel accounts, all four of the gospel accounts, uh, you you might miss these these things. You, you might not put two and two together and see. Wait a second, he was named uh, Cephas. Uh, or at the very beginning by Jesus. I mean, I thought he was named Cephas or Peter, you know, went down the, down the road a long time afterwards, uh, but he had already had that name. Jesus gave him that name when he first met him. All right, I'm going to go on. Uh, verse 43, the day, have you noticed that I haven't need to look at the uh, Amplified on any of these verses? It's, it's all pretty straightforward here. Uh, the day following Jesus, the, the, the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee. I'm, I guess I'm reading that wrong. It says, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. Uh, now, everybody else just seems to just, just follow him. He didn't, he didn't ask uh Andrew to follow him. John, he just was, John the Baptist said, that's the Lamb of God, and then he left and decided to follow him. Um, it doesn't say here that what Peter did in verse 42. It doesn't say that he dropped everything and followed him right then, but we know that from the other accounts, that's what happened. But here now, Philip, uh, Jesus says to him, follow me. 
Verse 44 says, Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he's identifying him as the one that the the Bible was prof had prophesied. The law and the prophets is the name of the Bible. Back then, they didn't call it the Bible. Uh, back then, they just call it the law and the prophet. I think the law was the first five books, and then after that, all the other books were written by various prophets. Those books we called the prophets. And so uh, as we go through this, you'll see that term, the law and the prophets over and over again, and they're just referring to all the Old Testament scriptures, uh, all the ones that we have. Um, so he's, he's identifying right there that this is the one that was promised. This is the one that they, Moses and the law and the prophets all wrote and for, foretold him. So all, already everybody seems to be very clear. Uh, I, I like this saying he's the one that Moses wrote about because Jesus says that on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, he goes through the law and the prophets and says everything that Moses wrote about him and, and that was prophesied about him. And Paul, in his uh, uh, evangelism, uh, for a long time, he didn't go off to the Gentiles. Every city he went right to the synagogue and pre preached to the Jews, and he would say, go through the scriptures and say all these things that were written in the law and the prophets it's they were all talking about jesus he's the one so this term the law and the prophets is is telling us that that uh uh the scriptures foretold jesus and that's another problem with a lot of people that they think that you can only uh, learn about salvation and jesus from Paul's writings. Uh, not only do we learn it from Paul's writings, uh, we learn it from all the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We also learn about it uh, in uh, uh, the Old Testament. All through the Old Testament, as they said right here, it's been talking about this Messiah, the Savior that would come will be the Son of God. Okay, here's something funny, though. It says, verse 46, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Uh, Nazareth was, that's probably like uh, here in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, we have over a million people probably a million and a half people living in this valley now. When I was born and raised here about 65 years ago, I mean, there was like 10, 20,000 people here. Now we've got a million or a million and a half within a valley, and the, the valley is surrounded by mountains. Um, but there's certain parts of this town that people think are, that's the good part of town, and you have another part, but that's the bad part of town. And we would say, well, over on, does anything good, could anything good come out of the west side? Could anything come out of the north, north town? You know, it's, it's not really the best part of town. And I guess that's how they were reacting about Nazareth. They didn't think, wow, oh, there's, that's, maybe that's the poor people or the criminals or the, the you know, the not successful people. I don't know, but um, he's, they're all surprised that he's, he's from Nazareth. And of course, one of the reasons that the, the Pharisees would not accept him is because they didn't realize he was from Bethlehem. The scriptures foretold that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem, but he's called Jesus of Nazareth. And they didn't understand that he's Jesus of Nazareth because he's, he's, he lives there, uh, but he was born in Bethlehem. Before I go on, you want to say anything? I have heard that there was a prophecy that said that he would be a Nazarene. 
Did, haven't you heard that before? There might be. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look it up and see. Okay. Uh, okay, verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile, Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now, there's uh, somebody I studied, I don't remember who it was. I can't remember how they came to this conclusion. But when, when Jesus uh, says he has no guile and um, he's a true Israelite, he has no guile. And Nathaniel's surprised, well, I've never met you before. He says, well, I saw you under the fig tree. Well, just seeing someone under a fig tree, normally that wouldn't cause, cause someone to say, well, you're the son of God. But that's what he's going to say. And so... Uh, there's uh, the, uh, the 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 fig tree, of course, is a is a people consider that to be like um, a picture of of Israel, the fig tree. And somebody theorized that he was reading the book of Isaiah, and I think something he says here. I don't know if you have any footnotes uh, in your Bible here uh, that, about this verse. But maybe it references what exactly how Jesus phrases it. It says, uh, uh, then in verse 49, Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. Now, why in the world would Nathanael proclaim that Jesus is the son of God based only on the fact that he said, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, did Jesus see him under the fig tree because Jesus was standing nearby watching him? Or did Jesus see him under the fig tree because he, it, he, uh, he wasn't present, but he could see it because God gave him a vision, a picture of what was happening? What do you think? Well, uh, I always thought that he was just stating that he knew he was a Jew and uh, but then again everybody was Jews over there weren't they <laughs> no there weren't everyone were not Jews I mean a lot of people there they were Romans I mean it was a it was an occupied town uh, you know Rome occupied it and so there were Romans, you had Samaritans, you had people from all over, you know, uh, either living there or at least coming in and out, you know, passing through. So, no, there was a lot of different people there. You couldn't, you couldn't just automatically assume everyone's an, an Israelite. Um, but do you find it interesting at all that based upon what transpired here, that Nathaniel would would proclaim Jesus to be the Son of God. Uh, right. It seems to be he seems to be overreacting. It seems like we're missing something here, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's. There's something missing, and I, I don't recall exactly what it was, but as I said, there's some person that was teaching on this years ago that I studied, and they thought that, that I don't know how they came up with this theory, but they thought that uh, Nathaniel was reading Isaiah uh, the, uh, under the fig tree, and Jesus was uh, aware of it, 
And that's why he calls him an Israelite with no guile. And I don't know the connection to it. So I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have the answer to that. But I find it interesting that, uh, one, that Nathaniel identifies him as the son of God. We also had Andrew identify him as the son of God. We also had John the Baptist identify him as the son of God. So my uh, thought that I've had over many, many years was that Peter was the first one to identify him as the son of God uh, at the time that we discussed earlier when, uh, when he sent everybody on a mission and they came back and Jesus said, who are the people saying I am? And they said, oh, you're that prophet or you're Elijah. And, P and then Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter boldly stepped forward and says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then, and then Jesus says, um, uh, you didn't get this from man. You got it from, from, um, from my father, told you that. And, and uh, you're going to be known as Peter. Uh, and, and, and on this rock, I will build my church. And Roman Catholics want to think that on Peter, the church is going to be based upon Peter being like the first pope. But the, the church is built not on the person of Peter, but on the on the doctrine that Peter said that Jesus is the Son of God. All right, uh, verse fifty. Uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree. Believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. So, so it seems that. Even Jesus is amazed that he became a believer based only on that. He said, that's nothing. That's nothing. I, just because I told you I saw you under the fig tree and that you believe, you're, you're going to see a lot greater things than that. Verse 51, and he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What do you think that's happening? Well, I don't think that that prophecy uh, was fulfilled uh, in the Gospels uh, as, as far as being recorded. Uh, it may be talking about when uh, Nathaniel went to be with the Lord. Well, let me read it again. Jesus said, verily, verily, he said, he said, I mean, definitely, definitely, I, I'm telling you, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Um, so I think that that is a reference back to um, a a. Old Testament prophecy. And I think that's also when Jesus is on trial and Caiaphas is um, demanding answers and Jesus won't speak. And then he says, um, um, I, I, uh, he, he phrased his question in a way where Jesus had to answer. And Jesus said, "Yes, it's as you sow. Uh, uh, I am. I am He, and you shall me see me." I think the same phraseology. See, you shall see uh, heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I think this is a quote from an Old Testament that refers to the Messiah. And so, when Jesus used that terminology uh, to uh, uh, here, and also to Caiaphas. At Jesus's trial, it's it's a claim that yes, I am the Son of God, the the Messiah, the Promised One. Okay, anything before we go on to the, begin the next chapter? Well, that makes sense. Okay, I can agree with that. Um. Interesting thing is, uh, 
I didn't even look at the amplified one time on this section here because it was all so clear cut. Let me look at the amplified anyway, just to see these verses and read it one time in that. And maybe it will reveal something to, to us that, that we've missed here. Amplified. If you're just watching this for the first time and you don't know me yet, uh, I'm what Brother Joe Byron called a, a KJV firstist. For 25 years, I was one of the strongest advocates uh, defending KJV onlyism. And then the last few years, I've moved away from that. And now I look at the KJV first, but I'm, uh, I do think that it can be helpful to look at other translations and commentaries and listen to other brothers and sisters get their comments as I'm asking Brother Eric here to help me understand things. I th I'm going to accept all the help I can get. And so I'm looking at the Amplified now. And let me read this whole section in the Amplified, starting with verse 35. I'll read it and let it flow here. It says, um, Again, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked along and said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following him and asked them, uh, what do you want? They answered him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, uh, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they went with him and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two heard, who heard that what John said, and as a result followed Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first looked uh, and found his own brother, Simon, and told him, uh, we have found the Messiah, which translated means the Christ. Uh, Andrew brought Simon to uh, Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go into Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me as my disciple, accepting me as your master and teacher and walking the same path of life that I walk. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, "Where we have found the one Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote about. Jesus from Nazareth, the son of Joseph, according to public record. Nathanael answered him, Come, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip replied, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Here is an Israelite indeed, a true descendant of Jacob, in whom there is no guile nor deceit nor duplicity. Nathanael said to Jesus, how do you know these things about me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, when you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus replied, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe in me? You will see greater things than this. Then he said to him, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, the bridge between heaven and earth. Hmm, that was interesting the way they phrased that. Let me read that again here. I assure you, you most, you and most solemnly say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, the bridge between heaven and earth. Now, interesting thing here is there's footnotes here uh, on this one that, uh, uh, let me see if any footnotes uh, are helpful. Uh, no, none of them, none of these footnotes pertain to the area, the part that we were con possibly confused about. Okay, brother. Maybe this is a good point to stop here um, and uh, go, begin with chapter two next time here. Let's do that. We're a little bit early, but 
That's all right. Um, all right, let's just rehash this here a little bit without even looking at the scriptures and give, give, give me your overview of chapter one. Now we've had, I think this is the fourth study. It's taken quite a long time. Uh, this tonight we got from verse 35 all the way to the end, which is verse, uh, let me see, how many verses are there? Uh, 51. So tonight we did 16 verses. And some of the other studies, we only did, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight verses because there was so much in each verse. So tonight we covered a lot more ground, but can you, in your own words, kind of sum up this whole chapter one for me? Okay. Now, uh, the book of John, chapter one, starts out with John the Baptist baptizing at the river Jordan and then the Pharisees come to him and want to know who he is and he's denying uh, everything categorically no 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 so <laughs> after that Jesus comes He's identified by John as the Lamb of God that comes to take the sin away the sins of the world. Jesus is baptized by John, and the Holy Spirit is lit upon him in the form of a dove. And uh, I believe in another gospel, at that point, he's carried away into the wilderness. But uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but on this gospel, uh, apparently he's sticking around for another day at least. So uh, we'll have to dig into that, see what's going on with that. And uh, it's very important, though, because uh, he's choosing his 12 disciples. And I always thought that he went to the wilderness uh, before he chose his disciples. Uh, okay, but this is where we're at right now. Okay, back to you. All right. Uh, well, well done. Um, a couple of things that I think are important to add is that you you didn't really start at the beginning. In fact, I think you skipped right over what I would say is the most important part of of the chapter, and maybe one of the most important parts of the whole book. Maybe one of the most important parts of the entire Bible, and that that's the first few verses of the Gospel of John, in which it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, it, and it, he created all things. Nothing was created that was not created by him. So uh, I think that those first three or four verses, we, we learn that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He's not a created being. He is the creator of all things. Uh, and then he became a man. The God... Uh, uh, was manifest in the flesh, uh, you know, God, the word became flesh. And then you see John the Baptist come into the scene. But that part there, uh, maybe you just forgot that we covered that at the beginning, but that is probably the most important part of all of this. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, this wilderness trip I don't think uh, I don't think that in John we're going to see any mention of Jesus's forty days in the wilderness. I believe that we'll probably find it in I don't know Matthew, Mark, maybe Luke. I don't know. Maybe met just Matthew and Mark. I, I, is so that that could make a person a skeptic. Say, well, I'm skeptical of the Bible because in one book it says one thing and in another book it says another thing. Well, let me give you a chance to answer that question. Why would, in one book, it says he's baptized and then goes up in the wilderness for 40 days and is tempted by Satan. And then here in John, uh, it talks about him meeting up, meeting some of these uh, early disciples. And wh wh why, why is there a difference there? Okay, you're going to give me a chance to answer that question. 
after I totally screwed up the first one. <laughs> you didn't screw it up. You just kind of skipped over something. And you started at the midpoint. Okay, but uh, wow, I don't know, Brother Luke. This is something that we're going to look into, aren't we? Well, this is just a concept that a person really has to understand about the Bible. Uh, otherwise, they could be easily not only confused, but also led astray by somebody who wants to uh, put doubts in their head and uh, make them uh, no longer a believer. See, people have less, left Christianity as they study the Bible and there are things that they can't answer and they don't understand. And then some, some atheist comes along and they get them confused and then they end lo losing their faith. It's very common. But the point is this, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now Matthew, we'll find out, was actually one of the 12 ap apostles. Mark, was not an apostle, but he was a he was a boy at the time that, that all this happened, and he got the account and wrote it down according to how Peter told him. So we could say Matthew wrote his, but Mark wrote Peter's account. Uh, Luke, uh, Luke was not an eyewitness. He was a companion, he was a physician, and he was the companion of the Apostle Paul for many years. And throughout the book of Acts, he wrote the book of Acts and the book of Luke. And the book of Acts is a historical account of the early church history. So he was a historian and he was also a physician. But as far as I know, he was not an eyewitness to Jesus at these early times. I don't even know if he was there until after, uh, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection. But Luke wrote uh, by investigating and getting, he was like a, an investigator. He's the one that talked to everybody and wrote down an account. And he talks about in the book of Luke how he's invested everything and it's proven beyond any doubt. There is no doubt what he's writing down. He was recognized as a very good historian. Uh, and then what he wrote in the book of Acts he was an eyewitness to all of that because he was a companion of Paul and uh, he talks about a lot of times we, he uses the word we all the time because he's referring to, you know, he was there with, with these people as all this was happening. He was one of the, uh, the uh, people in the story. But that gets me to this, the, the point I'm trying to make is that let's say that brother, you and I, and let's say we have brother Bill, and pick a fourth person. Who, who's our fourth companion here? It's got to be Sam. Huh? Uh, thick shades. Okay. So you got Sam, Bill, Eric, and Luke. And and let's say that we're we were following Jesus around and and uh, you know being his disciples and stuff. And and we were there, and all of us were there for parts of it, and maybe not there for certain other parts. Or maybe in some parts we were all there, but then after it's all done, we write it down. If you write it down, what you recall and what is important to you and what stands out to you and the point you're trying to make in your gospel account, they, they say this is the gospel according to John. This is the gospel according to Matthew. John also, by the way, um, this book here we're studying, John was an actual apostle. Uh, that, uh, he's, uh, he's, he hasn't come into the story yet, but the, he's the one writing this and he's an eyewitness. So John's account is an eyewitness account. Mark's is not. He got it from Peter. Luke's is not. He got it from Paul and investigating everybody else. So, uh, but you have these people giving their account of what happened. Uh, are you going to write your account and then every word that you put in your account and every single thing that happened is going to be completely the same as the way I tell the story? I don't think, I don't think all four of us are going to write it down word for word. And sometimes something important, I think something really important happened and I told about it and to you, you thought something else was more important, and that's what you talked about. And it doesn't mean that it didn't happen because 
I wrote it down and yet you didn't even write about it. It just means that that's not part of the story that you're telling. John, his story is, is really to teach us the, the message of salvation that he learned from Jesus and the identity of Jesus being God manifest in the flesh. Uh, so they each had kind of an agenda. Matthew, he was writing it primarily to the Jewish people writing and the genealogies that we get. Uh, Matthew's genealogy, uh, if I recall, starts with uh, 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 that would be with uh, Abraham, I think, without looking. And then Luke's would start with with Adam because he's thinking he's talking about it in a. If there is a genealogy for for uh, Luke, I'm not even sure. But the genealogies are not even the same because they start their genealogy at different points depending upon the audience for whom they wrote the book. Uh, the genealogy in John begins with, in the beginning was the word. It goes back before, before Abraham. It goes back before uh, uh, Moses, be before Adam and Eve. It goes back to the, in the beginning was the word. So uh, the reason these gospel accounts are not identical is because each story is to an audience that wants to emphasize a certain thing, that he is the one promised uh, to be the Messiah from the Jewish people. So it's traced back to that point. Another person tells a story, we want you to understand that he is uh, the one that was promised, but he is God Almighty who became a man. And uh, so I don't think we're going to see uh, the 40 days in the wilderness in the Gospel of John. I mean, I'm, I've read these many times, but I, I cannot tell you. If you look through study Bibles, you, you, it'll have a list of the four Gospel accounts. And it'll tell, okay, this particular story is in two of the books. And this one's in three of them. And this story here is in two of them. This story is only in one of them. But... It doesn't mean that the story wasn't true because it's not covered at all. It's just that the writer of the one didn't feel it was important to talk about that. His, his, he's trying to tell, emphasize something else. So I, I don't know if I confused you more or I helped you at all by telling you all that. No, that was very uh, well explained. Also, I remember uh, something about the four Gospels representing the four faces on the uh, beast. Uh, that's uh, uh, surrounding the throne of God. Uh, do you recollect that at all? I think I've heard that, but I can't. I don't know it well enough to, to even talk about it. There's so many things I've read and heard from other people that uh, uh, you know. You hear it one time ten years ago, and it, I'm not. I can't recall exactly how they came to that conclusion, or or I can't prove it myself. Um, but uh, I do seem to recall uh, somebody teaching that. So that, you know, that may very well be the case. Um, all right, let's, uh, we'll begin with chapter two uh, next time. Uh, but for now, I want to just do an invitation for people to receive the free gift of salvation. If you're watching this now, and you might not even know what I mean by that, by saying, I'm going to invite you to receive the free gift of salvation. Uh, most people, uh, most people in the world today, and most of the people who've ever lived, they they don't even have a clue that salvation is offered to you as a free gift. That's that's probably one of the most important things that you need to learn about the Bible and Christianity. Is that uh, if you want salvation, that means when you die, you don't have to worry about going to hell. You're saved from that. Uh, if you want the free gift of eternal life, that means that uh, not only are you saved from judgment and going to hell, but you get to go to heaven and live forever. And these are, salvation and eternal life, that's a free gift. Very few people even know that it's a free gift. Almost everybody who's ever lived, uh, almost everybody on the world today thinks these things are, are a reward when you get 
Heaven is a reward you get because you're a good person. All the religions of the world are based upon this concept. It's called the merit system, personal merit. Uh, if you're a good enough person, you get to go to heaven. If you're not good enough, you end up going to hell. That's the way the world sees it. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we do not go to heaven or hell based upon merit. We, we go to heaven or hell based upon faith. If we put our faith in Jesus, we go to heaven. If we never put our faith in Jesus, we go to hell instead. Hell being the second death in the lake of fire. Now, um, so the question is not how good we are. The question is, it, or it's, it's say, uh, the, how would I phrase it? Uh, uh, there, you know, here in Las Vegas, you know, I, I've grew up here and worked here and had my career here. And there's a saying, uh, if you want to be successful here, it's not uh, what you know, but who you know. Have you ever heard that saying? It's not what you know, but who you know. you got to know the right person. That's the way salvation is. If salvation is not based upon what we do, it's based upon who we know. It's not, it's not based upon um, um, uh, behaving. It's based upon believing. So that's what we, I want you to understand is that uh, you cannot go to heaven because you behaved and you were a good person and you did good things. That's not how it works. If that was the case, no one would get to go to heaven because the standard, the, the Bible tells us the standard that must be met is perfection. That means you'd have to be perfect. Not ever do one bad thing and just do good things constantly your whole life. Now, if you think that you can do that, go ahead and try. But the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. You can never reach that standard of perfection. And that's why God decided that, hey, man's in a helpless, hopeless situation. I'm going to have to save him. I'll become a man and I'll die for his sins. I'll pay for his sins. And then I'll offer him eternal life in heaven as a free gift if he'll just trust me. And that's what Jesus did. That's what the book of John tells us all about. It says in the beginning was the word. Well, in the beginning, before time began was the word and the word uh, was with God and the word was God. And then the word became flesh. This is about Jesus. In the beginning, Jesus was God. And then he became a man named Jesus. And he did it. He became a man for one reason. So he could die. He needed to become a man so he could die for our sins. And that's what he did. He died on the cross and he paid for all of our sins. So first thing you should do is thank you, Jesus. You paid for my sins. You love me so much that you were willing to die for me. If you understand how much he loves you, it's only natural for us to love him in return. Even the scriptures say, we love him because he first loved us. Um, so he not only died for our sins on the cross, but he was in that tomb for three days, but then he raised himself from the dead, alive again, bodily. And he walked on the earth for 40 days and showed himself to the apostles. He showed himself to his brother, James. He showed himself to 400 people at the same time. And for 40 days, he ate with them. He talked to them. He taught them. And then he ascended up to heaven. And he said the reason that he would raise himself from the dead was to give us a sign, a proof that he is God and he does have power over life and death. And he does. He has the power to give you life everlasting in heaven. If you want it, he's offering it to you. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So please understand that you don't get heaven as a reward for being a good person. You get heaven as a free gift when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you now to renounce religion, renounce personal merit, renounce striving and working your way to heaven, renounce that and, and embrace salvation as a free gift by faith alone in Christ alone. 
do it now and then make a comment let me know and once you receive the gift of salvation you're guaranteed you're going to heaven because jesus promises it he guarantees it to you no matter what brother uh, i'll say good night what else would you like to say before we close uh thank you brother luke i would like to admonish all your viewers to do just that to receive that free gift of eternal life in jesus christ you won't regret it do it today don't wait this is the most important topic in the whole universe your eternal soul deal with it now okay back to you brother luke okay all right uh thank you all for watching and uh i'm attempting to do these uh, live broadcasts nightly at 7 p.m pacific time and so uh we're kind of alternating between various studies uh, tonight we did the book of john we're also studying the book of job the book of proverbs and we're also doing a topic early church history so join us nightly 7 p.m pacific time bless you all in the name of our great savior god jesus christ